All right, case number five. And I apologize, some of these have gotten scratched on the cover slip from years of, of educational use, which I guess means they've been put to good use. All right, so what do you think about this one? Let's see what the history is. Okay, 55-year-old female. Well, do you know what it is? Yeah, it's like a periganglioma. Good. Yeah, so I was going to say, I gave away the diagnosis. It's a carotid body lesion. Yeah. Once you know it's right there on the carotid, then what else is it going to be, right? It's usually going to be a paraganglioma. Exactly. And the uh, feature, what, what is the microscopic pattern? Like a cell ball. Yeah, cell ball balls of cells. Although Zellballen sounds way cooler. And basically, by Zellballen, we mean these kind of tight nests of cells. They're round cells arranged in these packets or nests, and they're intervened, intervened by vascular channels, prominent vessels, right? See, there's the vessels right there. Now, obviously, depending on where you're located in the body, a lot of other things can be round kind of epithelioid cells arranged in nests, right? Epithelial tumors of, of various sorts. There's a lot of other things you could think of neuroendocrine carcinomas, like carcinoid tumors and stuff like that. So that can be a real problematic situation in some cases. Obviously, when you're in a classic site, like the, you know, right there in the carotid body, well, what this is the most likely thing is going to be this. Okay. So what is the, you know, here's the nice, uh, here's the nice uh, nuclear features, right? You've got, oh, let me get, sorry, it's a little washed out. There we go. You get nice, Nice, um, you know, salt and pepper, stippled, neuroendocrine type chromatin, right? That very sm small, speckly looking chromatin. And like with other neuroendocrine tumors, you oftentimes will have random pleomorphism, random large nuclei scattered in the midst of this. So that's a very helpful feature that it has that neuroendocrine look with the, with the nice stippled chromatin and the random atypical cells. Okay, and then uh, what, what immunostain, if you needed to do stains, what uh, immunostains would you want to do here? Uh, like uh, any type of neuroendocrine marker. Yeah, synaptophysin and chromogranin yeah. will be positive. And then an interesting thing, if you do S100, a lot of times you'll get scattered S100 positive cells around the outside of each of these nests or zellball and uh, packets, and those are called sustentacular cells. I have seen occasional times where it was clearly a paraganglioma, but that stain didn't work very well. So if it, when it works, it's great, but I feel like it doesn't always work as beautifully as it's illustrated in the books, let's say. Um, and then usually keratin will be negative, but sometimes you can have some keratin expression. And the reason that's important to know is that can lead people to make a diagnosis of neuroendocrine carcinoma. And I've seen that happen where a paraganglioma got confused with neuroendocrine carcinoma. And obviously, that's very different implication for the patient and potential treatment. And one place in the body where particularly uh, paragangliomas tend to have a lot of keratin is near the sacrum. Sometimes paragangliomas occur right around the presacral area or in the phylum terminale region. And so, and they can have a lot of strong keratin expression there and, and totally make you think of a metastatic neuroendocrine carcinoma. So that's a really important pitfall to be aware of. Um, what is the, um, what is the uh, diagnostic malignant feature? How do you know if a paraganglioma is benign or malignant? Um, metastasis. That's really it. As far as I know, and I'm not the, not the top expert on paraganglioma, but my understanding is basically we can't look at them and figure out from mitoses or nuclear pleomorphism. The, the typical things that we try to use to predict how tumors will behave don't work here. We only know if they're malignant once they metastasize. So that's the main thing that we know and a significant subset of them, depending on whether it's in the, the carotid area or if you have one in the adrenal, a subset of them will metastasize. And what, what is the, the fancy, what's the special name you give to this tumor if it occurs in the middle of the adrenal gland? Uh, pheo? Yeah, pheochromocytoma yeah. is basically the same thing as paraganglioma. The only difference is the name is if it's outside of the adrenal, then it's called pheochromocytoma. They are basically the same tumor. Okay, and so some paragangliomas are associated with a syndrome. They have a syndromic association. A lot of those syndromes are related to germline mutations of SDH, succinate dehydrogenase gene. Um, and also occasionally you can see them in association with uh, neurofibromatosis type 1. 
So good to know about that, that, that uh, subset of uh, paragangliomas and pheochromocytomas are syndromic and the rest uh, seem to be sporadic. So a good example of paraganglioma and pheochromocytoma would look identical to this, but it'd be in the um, adrenal medulla. Okay.